We are America's tackle shop. Anything fishing related, it's here at Fish USA. Hey guys, Chad here for Kayak Bass Fishing and welcome to today's video. I have the pleasure of being joined by Mr. Cody Milton. Cody is the 2018 Kayak Bass Fishing Angler of the Year. And the reason I have my phone in my hand is I'm going to get Cody to help me answer some subscriber questions. So Cody, I screenshotted this one last night because this is a really good question. Bradison Murphy asked the question, when you are scouting a lake that you aren't familiar with, are there any resources that you can recommend to find water temps, primary bait fish, current water levels, and anything else that might help with preparation? So let's focus on answering his questions of water temp, bait fish, current water levels, and anything else that might help with preparation. And the reason that I, I want you to answer this question is because obviously, at least in 2018, you did a better job of finding fish on a consistent basis uh, across the country on different fisheries than anybody else. So who better to answer that question? So Bradison, thanks for the question. And uh, you know, Cody, what do you think? The water temperature, I mean, obviously that's gonna change a lot based on just the wind, what part of the lake you're on. Um, but the primary bait, I mean, that's definitely something I always look at. Look at. Um, one of the easiest ways I've found it is really just any guide pages. If you're on a very, if you're on a body of water that's very popular at all, any guide pages usually are going to even have water temperature, water temperature from the last week, the week before. Um, but I mean, honestly, to kind of take it a little step farther, um, as far as the preparation goes, if you know you're fishing a kayak tournament, it'll eliminate water by just knowing where you can't go. Know the public ramps that you can get to and just focus on those areas. Um, that probably helped me more than anything last year. Um, so that's actually a, a pretty good point because I have people all the time that are overwhelmed by the size of a particular, a particular body of water. So if you take your boat ramps on Navionics or any chart and you draw like a, a circle around them and know what your range is, you can pretty much eliminate the water you can't fish. <laughs> Actually, that's a really good standalone tip, and I think that falls under anything else that might help with preparation. And so what do you, what do you consider your range on tournament day? Mine's been a three mile radius. This year with the Torquedo, it might be extended to <laughs> five or six miles. Um, right. Especially on like where the national championship waters are. There's, a, there's not an enormous amount of ramps, so like a Torquedo and people willing to make a long paddle are gonna have an advantage there. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. So, all right, so you've eliminated the water and you've decided uh, where you're going to fish. Let's go back to Bradis's question. Water temp resources. You said you find those on guide pages, but how much are you paying attention to water temperature when you're on the water? A, a enormous amount. Usually you want to hit the extremes. Like at Santee Cooper this past weekend, I knew I wanted to start in the north end just to see how much warmer it would be. And I went south and it was probably three or four degrees cooler. Um, so, I mean, know your extremes. I mean, know if you have an east wind, the east side is going to be colder or it's going to be warmer, excuse me. Well, it depends because that's a good yeah. point. If it's a cold front, it's going to be colder. If it's a, 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 if it's a warm front, it's going to be warmer. Uh, and I hear people all the time talking about fishing the windblown bank. And that's a good thing when it's a good thing. But when it's not, it can, you know, let's say that you're a late spring and you got a, one of those last nor'easters or northerns that blows in. That's going to be cold air. So that cold wind is going to be blowing to that bank. And if that shuts the fishing down, they're probably going to be on that protected side. So you really have to think about the variables that are out there. But but what Cody said, I think, is one of the top keys is to check the water temperature extremes. If you go to one end of the lake and it's one degree warmer than the, enti the entire other end of the lake, it probably is not going to make that much of a difference. But when you have three, four, five, six degrees for a cold-blooded animal like a fish, that could be a big deal. Especially in the, especially in the spring. Early yeah, the exactly. When their metabolism is starting to adjust and the photo period is starting to change and they're starting to think spawn, every little bit of temperature increase is going to help crank them up and get them ready and, and make them want to feed. Um, okay, so bait fish. What are your resources for figuring out what the bait fish are other than the obvious time on the water, the tow factor, getting out there and looking and listening? Uh, is it the same thing? Is it guide pages? And You know, honestly, you can go to the state pages. Like in Arkansas, I mean, the AGFC is going to, it names all the bait fish that, that are native to there and the ones that they stocked and usually how many they stocked. Like in my home lake, they stocked, I know that they stocked 1 million threadfin last year. Um, and two years ago, it came back as 0% threadfin in the lake. So, I mean, keeping up to date with, I mean, your state's not going to hide anything from you. I mean, you get on those the state pages. In fact, they're you know, legally like bound that. for the money that they spend to publish what they're doing. And so that, that's actually a good point and a good resource. But let's just say you go to a resource page and it lists 15 or 20 different species. How do you figure out which ones you're going to focus on? Do you focus on different forage and different species? Do you focus on them differently in different seasons? You know, walk through that a little bit. A, a little bit of both. I kind of like... 
I'll probably go about it a little different than most. I kind of I like to spend I, sp I spend my time deep going out deeper in the early part of the spring, and I'll actually stay shallow longer just because a lot of those big females stay up chasing broom. So that kind of ch it changes for me. Like thread fin, gizzard chad, those are going to be the deal in the early part of the year. I mean, you start hitting 52, 54 degree water, yeah, crawfish are going to come into play, like in Texas and stuff especially. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, in knowing what you're going for, like obviously those bigger females are gonna stay out deeper chasing balls of big gizzard shad. Um, and a lot of times they're not relating to anything, which makes it really tough. Um, but I like to, I mean, don't forget brim. Those big females will stay out chomping brim for a long time. Um, so when you say stay up chomping brim, explain that to, for the folks that don't exactly know what you're talking about. When you say stay up, what are the brim doing when they're staying up chomping them? They'll, they'll and it's crazy, like, you know, you, it's sometimes it's hard to predict a bass spawn, but it's the easiest thing in the world to predict a broom spawn. I mean, it is every two weeks for eight weeks period in the summer. Uh, it'll usually start in the end of May to go sometimes even into the middle of July. Um, and if you're seeing those, I mean, it's and almost and almost day. you know exclusively around the full moons. Oh, you know absolutely. what I mean? And so yeah. if you follow, follow your moon tables and you follow your so lunar times, uh, I think that those big females are like lions waiting on gazelles. They just sit out just off the edge of where the brim are spawning. And every now and then you even see them shoot up in there and hammer them. But for the most part, what they do is wait for that mm -hmm. stray gazelle to you know drift off of the plains and then gobble it up. But I agree. All right, so Cody, you talked about you stay, you start deep, but then you generally stay shallower than most people. Uh, the problem is we have a huge, you know, following here on Kayak Bass and TV, and a lot of people from different, you know, areas of the country, different types of fisheries, and so I always like to quantify when you, people make statements like that. So talk about what do you consider deep water when you're saying you focus on those deep, that deep water first, and what 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 exactly are you looking for when you do that? Um, and obviously the depth's going to be very relative to the water you're in. I mean, based on the clarity with the maximum depth, um, where I'm from, the lakes are typically 300, 350 foot deep in the deepest places. So, I mean, back home, like this time of year, I'm not going to be fishing anything in under 60 foot of water. And it doesn't mean they're on the bottom in 60 foot of water. It means I'm catching them on swim baits, a rigs over 35 foot of water. Um, but like this weekend in Santee Cooper, you know, you're not, you're in a lake that's not very deep. It's maxing out at 20, 25 foot. Um, and there's not a whole lot of creek channels in some places. And if, especially, I mean, they are going to follow creeks back into spawning flats. The mouth of, mouths of place that they're going to spawn in the early part of the year are money. I mean, the fish might spread out in the winter, but they are going to all congregate back to the mouths of creeks. Um, and if you can stay on creek edges in eight, even 12, it didn't have to be that deep and it didn't have to be that big of a drop, but they will relate to that because the bait fish are relating to it. And so that's funny you say that because I actually talk about that in my SWAT seminar in under seasonal progression. And I tell people that you use the, the acronym STD to catch more fish. You catch an STD, right? So it makes it easy to remember. And so I go shallow to deep, right? But I say that because most people can find spawning flats. Most people can find old beds. Most people have seen them. So if you know where the spawning areas are, you can work your way out. It doesn't mean you go shallow and come go to the deep water. It means you start with the known location and you back yourself out. If you use a creek uh, or a road bed or some type of natural travel corridor to that spawning flat as a roadmap to how they get there, like Cody said, you can generally back your way out. And I'm generally backing my way out and finding the first good hard creek bend or creek mouth or a creek entrance that might have, you know, one long point or two stubby points. Uh, if I've got a long point and a stubby point, uh, I like the stubby point. I really like those short, you know, more bulbous uh, points over those longer points. I think when they when they get into the post spawn and their chase and the shad spawn is on and the brim are spawning, they'll focus on those longer points because a lot of times that's where the brim spawn, the shad move up on those banks and spawn. But early on, I like those, you know, shorter, more abrupt points or humps, right? And a lot of people don't think about this, but the water is drawn down, you know, in the winter time and it starts to kind of fill back up in the spring and the summer. And so a lot of times what you know as a hump, right, in the, in the winter time that's out of the water might be an underwater hump uh, come spring and it definitely will be, uh, you know, moving into the middle of the summer. So do you find fish orient to those humps, 
you know, those humps that are exposed during the wintertime that lets the grass die off of them. And now they're kind of, you know, barren and then the grass starts to come back and there's chunk rock or, you know, any type of cover that are on those. Um, do you find that fish relate to that stuff, you know, oh, in the late winter, early spring? Um, especially because kind of what you said, um, the grass is going to die on those places that are exposed and they're just going to have hard grass lines or have hard cover lines. Um, and any time a bass can sit in cover and look out in the open, it's just an easy ambush place for them. And so one of the things I like to do is I like to do winter scouting where I go to these places when they're drawn down. And, you know, one of the things that comes to mind is several really good lakes in Kentucky that I fish a lot of times off, off camera or that I don't mention the name of is I like to go to those lakes in the winter time and fly the drone over it and look for exposed, you know, um, uh, brush piles, exposed Christmas trees, you know, exposed chunk rock and things, or just drive around from boat ramp to boat ramp, driving up over bridges. Bridges are a great scouting vantage point because a lot of times a bridge will be near a creek mouth. So you can pull over on the side of the road, walk out on the bridge, obviously make sure it's safe and make sure it's legal. And you can check out the entrances to creeks and see that there's big, you know, brush piles. I see pallet piles sometimes. I've seen old cars. And a lot of times those staging areas, those deep, deep creek mouths, as they fill back up with water and before those fish make their way up the creek to spawn on those harder banks can be a great staging area and that place that those fish hang out. And so for me, you know, I don't fish as many 300 foot deep reservoirs like, uh, uh, like Cody does, but a lot of the ones on the Tennessee River system can be 100, 120 feet. Um, and I, I generally find fish in that sub 30 foot uh, range for the type of fishing that I'm doing or I'll go somewhere to where there's fishing that's sub 30 feet. But it's interesting that you put that, you point that out. When you're fishing for fish 35 foot deep, are you fishing 35 foot deep or are you throwing and running the bait above them? Or, you know, what's your technique for that? No, I mean, they're generally, they will, they'll suspend, especially if the lake has pole timber. They rarely relate to the bottom. In my opinion, if there's pole timber. Um, with like the exception of places like Texas and Santee Cooper where there's such good bottom everywhere. Uh, but now, now say, define that real quick. What does good bottom mean? So it, I, the way I, you know, it's one reason I will keep like a Biffle Bug or a Carolina rig. Sometimes I won't even have a bait on a Carolina rig. I will just keep it just to test the bottom. And if I'm dragging it and, and just junk mucks coming up, I just know the fish are suspended and they're not going to hold on that. Um, with, I mean, that is kind of true, you know, with the exception of Okay, so you just said winter, what bad bottom is, now what's good bottom? Talk good about bottom is if I can feel every bump when I'm dragging something. Yeah, yeah. And I feel in, you know, with clay kind of being an exception, red clay, um, you don't necessarily feel that, but it is still really good bottom. But you now like Kentucky Lake, I mean, or it's places like that where there's really good bottom and you can constantly reel a bug and it's just, I mean, just, you know, you're constantly popping pea gravel, you know, you're, you're going to get an aggression strike pretty soon. Now, do you ever look at your depth finder and use your graph to figure out where the bottom transitions and the bottom, what the bottom consistency is? And if so, tell the folks exactly how you do that. Um, I absolutely, I do. And, um, <laughs> Is that something people, a lot of people don't want to talk about yeah. that. A lot of, you know, really accomplished anglers don't want to talk about those little nuances, but that's why we're doing this video. I find transitions on my depth finder all the time. Talk about how you do that. So I, I use a, I actually use Hummingbird. So the, the palette I use is a little different than Lowrance. Um, and I use down a lot. It's easier to find bottom composition with traditional because a lot of times if you're on a river system that's really silted in, you're either getting a light, light blue return or you're getting nothing. And you'll see it where it'll bump from like blinking blue to like red or dark green. And then once you're in red, like you're on a, you're on a transition place. And so what he means by blue and red, those can be different with different palettes. So I'll define in my, you know, my system, I'm a Lowrance guy. I use Lowrance a lot. And so regardless of the color that you get, it's the thickness of the return. A really hard bottom is going to give you a really thin, narrow, hard return. And a soft bottom is going to be more of a, 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 it looks mushy. It's a mushy return. So anywhere you can find those taper downs where it goes from mushy to hard or from hard to mushy, what I generally like to do is drop a waypoint right there, and then I'll start to do a zigzag pattern and try to find where that edge is. And then I'll generally drop a buoy, spin back around, fish with the sun in my face or the wind in my face, and work that transition line itself. And, you know, and I know you do this because I've watched you fish enough, and so I don't have to really ask, but I think that's one of the things that is probably and you can let me know if you agree, one of the most overlooked ways of finding fish Absolutely. is not just looking for something sticking up on your depth finder, not just looking for balls of bait, not just looking for, you know, arcs and returns, but actually saying to yourself, 
I just found a place that I know the fish will be, even if they're not here right now, and spend two hours, you know, doing a grid pattern or zigzagging and marking that out on your graph so that you've got this Hansel and Gretel crumb trail. And then the next time you come through there, or if you say to yourself, hey, the fish are not here right now, or I can see them, but they're sitting on bottom. I've drug a Cinco in their face. I've thrown a Carolina rig. I can't get them to eat, but I know as soon as it turns on, they're going to move up to this flat. And then you can use that as a reference point. Set yourself a mental note and know that that's a go-to place when things start to transition. Do you do stuff like that? that yeah, absolutely. And that that's huge. In the, I mean, that is huge in the pre-spawn. Um, <laughs> it's, so... it's, it's everything. And um, you know what's and funny, it allows you to fish fast too, which especially if you know you have a 150 yard stretch that's got bad bottom to good bottom. I mean, I use a bug. You can do it with a crane bait and things, but just throw it up in. A lot of times, it's even two and a half foot of water and drag it into six and stuff. Especially in the pre-spawn. Um, but yeah, to take it a step further. Um, it's you know, it's really funny you said the bug, bug, but you know what I do? I actually just keep a, a a rod either inside the boat or even in my rod holder that's got a two ounce tungsten weight or an ounce and a half tungsten weight that's just naked on there and i throw it out i call it my cajun depth finder i bump it along the bottom i'm looking for consistency transition i'm looking for that slimy mucky stuff uh, i'm looking for good you know hydrilla that breaks off real easy uh, especially if you can't necessarily uh, ascertain what it is on the graph coontail millful you know those kind of things um and so yeah i mean what i like about it is though not only is it great for tournament fishing, and this is not going to be relevant to you know you particularly answering the tournament fishing question, but those bottom transitions can be the best night fishing places ever. When you go back there at night and you're slow rolling uh, a Carolina or uh, you're slow bumping a Carolina rig with a, a floating bait on it like a trick worm or a lizard, or if you're slow rolling a yes. Colorado blade or you know slow cranking a deep crank bait, you know I'll just throw this in here because that's the whole purpose of this conversation. Night fishing in the summertime, finding one of those transition places. Places. Now that transition place might be somewhere they go post spawn, but during the summer that fish might be down in 60, 70, 80 foot of water, but that's where they move up to to feed at night, not necessarily from there up to the shallow water. So that's shallower water. But man, I'm going to tell you, setting up on those places at night, um, you know what I mean? And throwing something that puts off a good thump or vibration. I like to take my crankbaits and modify them by drilling a hole in the top and dropping some shot in there tipping them forward in a fly fishing scale, oozing some epoxy in there so they drive forward, throw that thing out there, rump, reel it down to the bottom and bump, bump it. But when you stop it, it truly suspends. Mm -hmm. It's not one of those ones that, that suspends in 70 degree water temperature, but you know, in 50 degree water temperature, it skyrockets up and in 80 degree water temperature, it just sits on the bottom. But you play with that and man, I've video game fished that before. Throw it out there and watch it. And you can see it on the graph and you can see the fish come up behind. Have you done that? I have. Dude, it's so, <laughs> so anyway. Let's get back to the, to the rest of the questions. So we've done some overarching stuff. Look right at the folks at home and say to them, if there was three things that you think are the keys to being successful when it comes to tournament fishing that, you, that they have to do that they might not be doing, what would they be? I mean, I would, I would go back to what I said. It would, I, would, I would eliminate water by the ramps I can launch at, and I would only throw baits that I have confidence in, an enormous amount of confidence. I mean, I could have fished out of a brown bag this last year. I mean, it was three, four baits, um, and they work. I'm not big into color and things like that. I mean, but how did you get the confidence? You got the confidence by catching, by catching fish, on fish on them. Yeah, you know. Absolutely. Um, and the third would be, you know, pay attention to boat tournaments. Um, I come from the boat, and I and I constantly still keep up with how tournaments are doing before I get there. Or tournaments. It's another thing. Water recycles. I pay more attention to tournaments that happened in 2002 and 2005 than I do ones that happened a year ago. I say that all the time about using fishing reports as an almanac, mm -hmm. and using fishing reports as an almanac. <laughs> Not necessarily what's going on right now, but using it to go back and to develop trends. All right. So you touched on something that is going to lead to a no video. So we're going to end this right here because that's some great content. But Cody just said, hey, man, I could have fished out of a brown bag last year, which means he only fished with a few baits. So thanks for watching this video. Give this video a thumbs up. Go follow this guy at Kodiak, Kodiak Fishing, but it's spelled Cody, C-O-D-Y you know, Cody Yak fishing to play on words and uh, go follow him. I'll put his stuff in the description box so you can go uh, check out his channel. He's going to drop some tips and tactics and techniques. We're going to get him to blog some for KBF this year to share some of those tips, but you're going to need to come back. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, turn on that notifications because in the next video, I'm going to twist his arm to tell us exactly what those lures are that are in that brown bag. So thanks for watching. We'll see y'all in the next video.